Thank you. Um, I too really appreciate the opportunity to have a, a dialogue here in this context with this, this audience and I will not waste time and get right to what I want to talk about. And the title of my talk might be a little confusing because I talk about nutritional ketosis. You may not have heard that term. Um, I coined that term probably 30 years ago in a couple papers that I published because there was a great deal of confusion, particularly even among physicians, and the difference between ketones and ketosis induced by dietary carbohydrate restriction versus ketosis caused by absence of insulin type 1 diabetics, which leads to ketoacidosis. And many of us have been taught that ketones are the, the classic the line is toxic byproducts of fat metabolism. Um, and they can have that effect in very high levels, but they're also a useful substrate. So I'd like to try to uh, destroy a few myths here. I'm going to take some really old data that's from before any of us were born, including me, um, and data that uh, uh, is more recent and put together a story. This, I'm going to have about five or seven minutes less than I thought I was going to have, so I'm going to talk real fast and maybe skip a couple slides. So, this is um, some data that came out of, these are pictures that came from research done in George Cahill's lab at the Joslin back in the 1960s. And they were studying uh, uh, total starvation in people. And they would take obese subjects, lock them up in their metabolic ward, and feed them nothing but water and a vitamin pill and a little bit of minerals uh, for up to four to six weeks. And they studied how the body adapted. And within a day or two of taking away insulin, or uh, taking away carbs and all, all calories, insulin level dropped. The, uh, hormone sensitive lipase released, released increased fatty acids into the bloodstream. And those increased fatty acids going into the bloodstream, along with the depletion of glycogen from the liver, resulted in the liver taking that fat and turning some of it into ketones. Most of the re that released fat goes directly to skeletal muscle and other organs that burn fat, preferentially burn fat. But as the liver makes ketones, some of those ketones can be burned by muscle. But <coughs> once the body goes through an adaptation process, the majority of the ketones released from the liver go to the brain and help feed the brain. The human brain, whether you use it a lot or not, burns about 600 calories a day. Uh, it only weighs three pounds, burns 600 calories a day. And if you are e eating carbs and, have a, and don't have circulating ketones, the only significant fuel your brain can use is, is glucose. So you have to have 600 calories of glucose per day to feed your brain, unless or until you go through starvation adaptation. And then you can feed most of your brain's requirements from, from uh, uh, ketones rather than from glucose. So let's put this on a scale, and I'll, I'll point out this is on the, on the bottom here is blood ketone concentration. And the, when we say ketones, the majority in the blood is something called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And then if we look at optimal use by the brain, as you go from zero, very low ketones, up to about three millimolar, you can see that the use by the, by ketones by the brain goes way up. Once you get past there, and this, this is discontinuous here, so this is three, this is five, that's 10. And the farther out here you go, this is ketoacidosis. And ketoacidosis is somewhere between 10 and 25 millimolar beta-hydroxybutyrate. And obviously, it's not, at that level, it's not providing a fuel. It re results in a metabolic acidemia that uh, significantly uh, uh, impairs cellular oxidative metabolism. So starvation ketosis, when you feed no calories at all, is here in about the 3 to 5 millimolar range. But if you're eating moderate protein and very low, carbo low, very low carbohydrate, you, in this range that we call nutritional ketosis, it starts at about 0.5, but the really effective range is in the 1 to 2.5 or 1 to 3 range. And this is an order of magnitude different from ketoacidosis. In the same way that normal blood sugar is an order of magnitude away from full-blown diabetic, uh, uncontrolled diabetes and hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. Uh, so this is ketones as nutrients. This is ketones as, as uh, being toxic, and it's a very, very different setting. Um, and the other point is that it's not just the carbs you eat, but even protein that you eat will drive down ketones, because protein is anti-ketogenic, not to the same degree per gram as carbohydrate. But still, you can't be in nutritional ketosis and eat a very high protein diet. So here are some people who are, were in ketosis when this picture was taken. This is a photograph taken on the, the Canadian North Slope. These are, this is uh, I'm surely the first camera these people ever saw and maybe the first uh, Caucasian person with the camera that these people saw. And these people have lived, and they and their ancestors have lived for 3,000 years in an area where there are no fields of waving grain. There are not a lot of fruits and vegetables to be eaten. Uh, and if there are, is any vegetable matter, it's available for three months a year. And the other nine months a year, they're living on the fruits of hunting. And by the way, these people ate a lot of red meat. Um, the thing they didn't do is they did not write down what they ate. 
And we destroyed their culture before we <laughs> made systematic analysis of what their actual dietary practices were. Um, my ancestor did that some. You know? Anyway, um, I'll take the blame. But so, you know, how do we know what these people ate? Well, there were a few unique people. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm back. Um, this is a picture that's taken from a diary of a guy named Frederick Swatka. He was a U.S. Army surgeon. Um, and back in the, when the, uh, the surgeons pulled arrows out of people, okay? Um, this was 1878 to 1880. He went into the Arctic trying to determine the fate of a lost Royal Navy expedition that was trying to transit the Northwest Passage. Disappeared, and back in that time, everybody wanted to figure out what happened to the Franklin expedition. And a lot of people went in, went in with big expeditions with all their food and trekked into the Arctic, and many of them died. Uh, Swatka went in with four people, four uh, Caucasians, and he joined up with some Inuits and um, tried to figure out how do these people live out here and can we live like they do? And it's interesting because here are native people speaking and here are Caucasians taking notes. So this guy actually wrote down and kept in his diary not just where they went but what these people did. Uh, unfortunately, it was never published in his lifetime. It was, it was published in 1965 by the Marine Historical Society in uh, Connecticut but never got wide publication. But there's a really interesting observation in Swatka's diary that I think is very important. And if you get one, if, you, if they make me stop talking right now, if you take this one message away, you'll learn something I think really important. And that is, in his diary, now they set out two Inuit families um, and, these, uh, and, and loaded sleds, but they only had one month's food supply. They set off on, on this 3,000 mile trek. They were gone for 13 months. They only had a month's food supply, and when that ran out, they then lived off the land. And what he wrote is, when first thrown wholly upon the diet of reindeer, reindeer meat, it seems inappropriately to proper, properly nourish the system, and there is an apparent weakness and inability to perform ex exertive journeys. Now, you've all heard, have heard of carbohydrate loading, and that's what carbohydrate loading says. You, you know, if you put people on a low carbohydrate diet, they can't do much, but if you put them on a high carbohydrate diet, they can do a lot. But then he says, but this soon passes away in the course of two or three weeks. This guy defined the concept of keto adaptation. Humans don't make the transition from a high carb diet to a very low carb diet overnight or even in a week. And he says two or three weeks, and it may actually be a bit longer. But I thought that was a, a really important observation that he made. Another person in the Arctic was uh, uh, a rather controversial but uh, <laughs> remarkable guy named uh, Wilhelm Stefansson. He was a Harvard trained anthropologist and he lived extensively among the Inuit from 1905 to 1917. And he um, at, for times lived for over a year among the Inuit without resupply, uh, living on with, uh, with their lifestyle, eating their food. And when he came back and wrote that he could do this, he said, oh, by the way, I ate no fruits and vegetables for um, over a year at a time, and I didn't get sick. I didn't get scurvy, because, you know, they figured out vitamin C and scurvy in this time frame. So he came back and said that, and they, he, they, he scandalized the nutritional establishment. And in order to salvage his reputation, because he was brutalized in the literature and in the press, he allowed himself to be basically locked up in Bellevue Hospital in New York City in a one-year-long experiment. Now, Bellevue is where they put crazy people, right? Um, now, he wasn't locked up in the hospital for a year. He was locked up for the first four or five months. And then one of his fellow um, uh, uh, explorers went in with him, and he was up, locked up for a little longer. But the experiment went on for a year. The investigators who set up this experiment were sure he was going to develop obvious scurvy within four months when he ate a diet of just meat and fat. Um, and when he didn't, they were, very dis they were very surprised. And to their credit, they published it in the uh, in Journal of Biological Chemistry in 1930. Um, so here's the reference here, uh, McClellan et al., JBC. Um, but what did he eat? People assumed that the Inuit ate high-protein diets. They were saying, oh, yeah, they're, they're hunters. They eat a high-protein diet. Well, Stefansson was eating because he knew he had to eat the diet that kept him healthy in the Arctic. So I'm assuming that he, in order to salvage his reputation, he ate truly what he had been taught by the Inuit. So he had 115 grams of protein. It was maybe around 15%, most 20% of his daily energy expenditure, over 200 grams a day of fat, less than 10 grams of carb. And whatever carb he ate was not from fruits or vegetables, but from the glycogen that was actually in the meat that he was, that he was being fed. And he ate a whole range of foods, meat, fish, poultry, brains, marrow, liver and kidney, organ meats. And the important thing is a lot of the eat meat he ate was boiled, and when he ate boiled meat, he drank the broth. And the reason, in retrospect, why you have to drink the broth is you need the potassium. And when you put a piece of turkey in a pot and boil it for half an hour, if it's two centimeters thick and you boil I did this experiment, half the potassium in the meat comes out in the broth. 
If you didn't eat the turkey and throw away the broth, you're throwing away the potassium. These people were smart. They figured it out long before we had people like Lavoisier teaching us chemistry. So one of my early experiments is I figured, you know, everybody's preaching, you know, carbohydrate loading and you have to have carbs to exercise, but here's this guy who said you have to have three, or three weeks or so to adapt and then your performance comes back. So I said, what if we take a group of highly trained athletes? So we recruited, recruited five highly trained bike racers, non-professionals but licensed bike racers, and we locked them up in the metabolic research ward at MIT in, in Cambridge. And we put them on a diet, basically patterned after what Stephenson ate, but you know, we used, used modern market foods. And we gave them a variety of foods uh, from which they could eat, including fish, poultry, and, and uh, red meat. We gave them 15% protein, 80% fat, and less than 2% as carbohydrates. Again, the carbohydrates came from the glycogen inherent in the meat itself. They were on it for four weeks. We tested them at baseline before they um, went on this diet, eating their, their habitual diet. And part of the testing involved an endurance bike ride where they rode to exhaustion. And you notice the bandage here. We did, before the ride, we did a muscle biopsy with a five millimeter side cutting barrister needle uh, to get muscle and look at muscle glycogen content. We infused stable isotope glucose in one arm, took blood samples from the other arm. And we're looking at the fuel requirements that, that, that these people had as when they did this exercise. I'm running through this quack quick, but Here's the data, their VO2 max, peak aerobic power before in liters per minute, total body was 5.1 liters per minute. That's a very, that's 5.1 liters of oxygen consumer per minute is, translates to 1,800 calories of energy expenditure per hour. But they, they don't ride at 100% of that, but they do ride at 60 or 70%. So four weeks later, their VO2 max was unchanged, 5.0. So four weeks without any carbohydrate and their peak aerobic power was unchanged. We had them do exercise, endurance to exhaustion is 65% of VO2 max. This is 930 calories per hour average on a stationary bike in the lab. If you think that's easy, try it. Uh, this is really hard work. They went for 147 minutes on the baseline carb, high carb diet, 151. These numbers are statistically no different. So there's no loss of peak aerobic power, no loss of endurance performance. What did change is if you look at respiratory quotient, this is the ratio of CO2 produced to oxygen consumed that tells you what percent of what you're burning is carbs versus what is fat. And the RQ of carbohydrate is 1.0, the RQ of fat is 0.7. So, and by the way, they were eating nothing during this test. So all this came from body source. So they were burning at 8.83, about a 50-50 mixture of carbohydrate and fat when they were adapted to their baseline diet. When we had, gave them four weeks on the low carb diet, they dropped their RQ to 0.72. That's over 90% of their energy is coming from fat. We turned these guys into prodigious fat burning, well, the diet turned these guys into prodigious fat burning machines. The gl muscle glycogen didn't go away completely. This is the baseline values. Um, when they did the first exercise test, it dropped from 143 to 56 millimoles per kilogram wet weight of muscle. A month later, now these guys kept their training up during this time period, by the way. They were doing 100 to 200 miles a week on the road while they were in this protocol. And yet they managed to recover from 56 to 76 and then when they did the final exercise test, they only, from 76 to 53, so this is the change, the delta value. So they did the same amount of work with one quarter as much glycogen, with just one month of adaptation to the diet, okay? So there was a dramatic change in fuel use in these guys. And that's emphasized if you, and to put that in perspective, if you look at, at, at fat burned in grams per hour from zero to 120 here, this is a study, this is data from a study published by a Danish group, Venables, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, uh, Dutch group, Venables et al. They took 300 people, untrained and plus highly trained athletes, and did graded exercise tests and measured each individual's maximum rate of fat oxidation. That was on their diet, what's the fastest, the greatest amount of fat that these, they could burn per minute? And the highest number they got was 60. And the average value was 28. But the, this, let's say 60 is the highest among the highly trained athletes. When we looked at our five bike racers, the lowest was 74, the highest was 112, and the average was 90. So we had markedly improved their ability to use fat for fuel during exercise. And that was basically indicates what, what happens when you give people a chance to um, adapt to using fat as their primary fuel. And some of that is being made into ketones and being used to fuel the brain in the process, which means they don't need the glucose, they don't need to break down muscle for gluconeogenesis to feed the brain with glucose because you're feeding it with ketones. So we published all this data 30 plus years ago. And people have asked me, so 
obviously nobody believed you because nobody's ever done anything with it. Well, it took about 25 years. And then there's some interesting people who started doing interesting things with this. And a particular area of interest in this is in the ultra marathon running community. Because if you run more than a marathon distance, you can't store enough glycogen in your body to finish a marathon, to go, go beyond a marathon. And there are people now doing 1,500 mile races. And their problem is, how do I fuel my body for the second, third, or fourth marathon in this, you know, marathon distance in this race? So this is a picture, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a skinny, whoops, wrong, wrong button here. Go back. This is a skinny looking guy standing under a banner that says, Western States 100 mile endurance run, Squaw Valley to Auburn. About every year, about 400 people start from Squaw Valley and, Valley and run over the Sierras, not on roads, but on mountain trails. And the winner is the person who gets to Auburn first. It's a 100 mile trail run. And if you can read it up here, it says 14 hours, 46 minutes, and 45 seconds. Tim Olson had run this, this distance 14, in a little under 15 hours, he ran 100 miles on trails. And now he did win the race. He was 15 head minutes ahead of his nearest competitor, and he beat the course record by 20 minutes. And a year ago, this runner switched to a low-carb fueling strategy with the advice of, a very, of some pioneering advisors, uh, whose names I won't mention. Um, is he a fluke? Well, here's a guy named Zach Bitter. He's running just 50 miles in this race uh, in the Midwest. And again, he's switched to a low-carb from a high-carb fueling strategy within the last year. And he came within two minutes of breaking the all-time course record on this, this race. So there are some people out there who are doing remarkable things with low carb, proving that you don't need carbs to do remarkable amounts of physical performance. But then you have to ask, ask the question, OK, these guys would do anything to get an edge to win the race, right? So even if it killed them later on in life. <laughs> so is this really safe? <laughs> so I want to quickly show you some data from a study that Jeff Volek did in his lab at the University of Connecticut, and I was peripherally involved in this. But basically, he took a group of people with metabolic syndrome, 40 of them, and he randomized half of them to a high, relatively high carbohydrate, low fat, a balanced weight loss diet, and half to a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Similar number of calories, much less carbohydrate, a little bit more protein, and lots of fat. And they were on it for a total of 12 weeks. It was an outpatient study with close monitoring. Um, and you can see the weight loss differences between the two, that they're about twice as much weight lost. And this, all this difference wasn't all, all, wasn't all water. You know, you've been told that low-carb diets make you lose water. Well, you lose about a kilo of water associated with that glycogen that goes down in your muscles. But you, don't, you lose four kilos difference in water. You lose about one kilo in the rest of the body fat. So this shows the lipid changes from the low-carb ketogenic group versus the low-fat group. Um, you say, well, look, the, the LDL went up in the low carb group, and it went down in the low fat. But these differences are not statistically significant. It's very little change in LDL cholesterol in these people with metabolic syndrome. But again, metabolic syndrome is not usually characterized by hypercholesterolemia. It's characterized by low HDL and very high triglycerides. But what did change in LDL is LDL particle size. This looks like a small number, but this is a dramatic reduction in LDL particle size. A lot of these people went from pattern B, bad, low, very small, dense LDL, to larger less dense LDL. Uh, so a dramatic shift in the LDL particle size. HDL went up 1%, which is not statistically significant on a low-fat diet, went up 13% on the low-carb diet. And you've seen this in many studies. And Dr. Forsetto showed you data from Dr. Westman's study, where again, HDL went up. Triglycerides went down dramatically. It went down well in both groups, but they went down. They were cut in half with the low-carb ketogenic diet. But the things I want to try to finish up on really quickly is we measured the not just how much triglyceride had, but how much saturated fat there is in their triglycerides. Okay? Now, we all know saturated fat's bad. But the big questions come is, what role does dietary saturated fat play in blood saturated fat levels? And the answer recently from multiple large studies is, there's no good relationship between dietary saturated fat and blood saturated fats. But the blood saturated fat level itself in multiple prospective randomized or prospective studies, blood saturated fat particular percent in your triglyceride is a very strong predictor of, of um, heart attack and diabetes risk. And we found marked reductions in saturated fats. And the fascinating thing is these patients were eating a diet that had three times as much saturated fat in it on this diet, and yet their blood levels went down. The answer is that they were burning it very fast. When you 
adapt them to become prodigious fat burners, a class of fats that's pre preferentially mobilized and oxidized are the saturated fats. And if you make it into CO2 or water, it doesn't accumulate, and it's probably not going to hurt you. The other thing we looked at were inflammatory biomarkers. Now, some people say, well, we, me we measured CRP or we measured IL-6. But it turns out that none of those by themselves are really clear, good markers. So we measured a panel of 14 of them. And of the, on the VLCKD, 14 out of 14 were reduced. In this other diet, on the high-carb, high, high carb, low-fat diet, 6 out of 14 were reduced. But what was remarkable that of the, in seven of the, the group, this is baseline. If it goes up, it went up. If it goes down, it went down. The low-carb diet, seven of them had sig highly significant reductions uh, in IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha, all the way over here to PI-1, um, and dramatically different than the low-fat, similar calorie level, but the low-fat, high-carb diet. And what that's, the message I would say is, we've seen this in two other studies we've done, by the way, this is not an isolated observation, is that a well-formulated, low-carb, ketogenic diet is, can be profoundly anti-inflammatory. <coughs> and you know, inflammation is not just about heart disease anymore. Inflammation predicts incident diabetes 10, 20 years later. Um, and I think in the New England Journal of Medicine this week, inflammation is now impl implicated in the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. So not a minor target. There aren't too many drugs that, that you can use long term to reduce inflammation other than the side effect of some of the modern statins, which themselves have side effects. This is not a drug, it's a diet, and it's, it's potent anti-inflammatory. How many more minutes do I have? Zero, one? Five. Really? <laughs> have I been talking fast? Been okay. Um, so, um, so is there a middle, you know, to get to nutritional ketosis, what if someone hears this and they're like, well, so I should eat more saturated fat, but they're just doing it in a moderate way, but, but, are they gonna end up with more saturated fat yeah. in their blood? Well, we fed people actually a lot. We, we did a eucaloric feeding, not a hypocaloric feeding. A eucaloric feeding study with a high saturated fat intake, and the saturated fat in the blood went down <coughs> after they were keto adapted. So the key is, if you're going to eat a lot of saturated fat, you've got to be keto adapted, because if you get up out of nutritional ketosis, and we're doing the, the incremental feeding study now, we're doing a whole range of carb from very low to very high in three week segments, and we will have this data in another six months. But the initial data tells us that as soon as you get them out of nutritional ketosis, and I'll show you that slide in one of my last three minutes, um, then, then that benefit goes away. So this is not a broad ocean of safety. This is Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And you have to have a GPS to get there, because if you go partway there, you're going to have a long swim to find your first beach. <laughs> okay? Did you use that same three-week period for a keto adaptation when you were measuring the blood saturated? They were on it for 12 weeks. And then you measure blood after 12? Yes. Okay. And by the way, we've also done this in mice and see the same thing. And we look at their adipose tissue, and they're not just sticking all the saturated fat into their adipose tissue. If you keto adapt a mouse, it, it accelerates its rate of, fat oxida of saturated fat oxidation, even though you're feeding them three times as much saturated fat. So it's, it's, it's paradoxical. It's counterintuitive. And by the way, we haven't get that, gotten that paper published yet after multiple, multiple tries because it keeps getting thrown back at us as being impossible. <laughs> so this is the saturated fat data. So this is a change in saturated fat. The high, or the high fat, here it's called carb restricted, but this VLCKD diet, 36 grams of saturated for that. The low fat, fat, saturated fat per day, low fat, 12 grams per day. And you can see how much the saturated fat goes down in the group fed the high fat diet uh, in spite of eating that much more. Uh, and I'll skip this. There's a biomarker of lipogenesis that also goes down. Um, I'm told I'm allowed to tell you about a book and at the end if we have time I'll, I'll show you. We've written this all down in the book by the way. So um, I'm talking fast but that we actually have a, a book that explains it in a little bit more than 30 minutes. So if you eat carbohydrate, it doesn't matter whether it's complex um, uh, carbohydrate or um, uh, simple sugars that that enters the bloodstream and at any one point in time you have 10 to 20 grams of glucose circulating in your blood. But if you eat 200, 300, 400 grams of carbohydrate per day, that's got to transit through the bloodstream. Whether you digest it in half an hour or four or five hours, it's got to transit through the bloodstream and go somewhere as glucose. And 
the primary place it goes is in the muscle where it's either oxidized or made stored as glycogen. So if you eat 400 grams of carbohydrate per day and you didn't burn any of it, that'd be enough to fill your muscles completely. So obviously the body puts it through and gets rid of it and burns it, but it's a real-time high turnover process. But if it, you have insulin resistance and it's hard to get it in the muscle, it goes to the liver and it goes to be made in, in, in the fat in the liver. And that shows up in the blood as increased saturated fats and increased biomarker of lipogenesis, which we've seen and published. So we say that these changes, high triglycerides, high saturated fat, high, mark, high biomarkers of lipogenesis, is a sign of carbohydrate intolerance. Now, if you have lactose intolerance and you get gastrointestinal upset and flatulence and diarrhea, the way you cure that problem is you feed people less lactose. If you have gluten intolerance and you have non-tropical non sprue, what do you do? You take gluten out of the diet, people get a lot better. So if you've got insulin resistance, backup of carbohydrate into pathways of lipogenesis, then we should call that carbohydrate intolerance. Do all of us have it? No. We, are, we live in a very wide spectrum. There are people who are very insulin sensitive, and they can handle carbohydrates very well. Let them have a high carbohydrate diet. That's the right diet for them. Their bodies metabolize it and use it. That's great. But if you're insulin resistant, whether type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, these are signs not proof, but signs that you're carbohydrate intolerant. And the degree to which you reduce carbohydrate is determined by your degree of intolerance. And we have to grade it to the individual and not say, this is the one perfect diet everybody should eat. I would hope that we can agree. We should have multiple tools, dietary tools, to help a wide, diverse range of people improve their well-being and function. So you, know, you sort of set up a target. I mean, some people can eat way outside this target and do well. Some of us have to stay under here. And the threshold for keto, nutritional ketosis is about um, uh, 50 grams of carbohydrate per day for the average person over multiple weeks of, of being on the diet. But I have a, a physician colleague who was a full-blown type 2 diabetic, severe type 2 diabetic. He's been eating 25 grams or less of carbohydrate per day since the year 2000. And he's been in complete remission of his diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C under 4.5 for the last 12 years. There is no drug that does that. It gets long, wow, okay, I was about to quit. So what does the diet look like? Well, this is kind of, I, had, I, I don't like N's N of 1 experiments, <laughs> but, I, but I am an N of 1. This is kind of what I eat, not every day. But just, you know, people say, oh, Atkins, he ate sausages for breakfast. Oops. <laughs> but hey, this is an easy breakfast. Four sausages, I, you know, bing, breakfast is done in five minutes. Lunch, I make myself a big salad with olives and a nice dressing with lots of olive oil in it. I eat nuts, I eat cheese, I eat more vegetables, I make my own homemade tomato bisque from my, my heirloom tomatoes in the garden. I eat a modest a serving of steak. And I also make my own ice cream. It's not commercially available, but you can have really delicious ice cream on this diet. Now that doesn't fit in with the paleo concept that you know my ancestors didn't start drinking milk till a couple thousand years ago. So, but I mean, all of us are different. You try, find out what works for you, and do the best you can with that. So it only works if it's sustainable. Can you stay on this long term? And our hypothesis, Jeff Wolick and myself and others, is that if you get multiple things right, if you can't just cut out the carbohydrate and say, it's, oh, that's sustainable. Because if you eat moderate protein, but you won't eat much fat, then you don't have enough energy, and you're going to waste away and die. You've got to get your energy from somewhere. If you want to stay in nutritional ketosis, you have to eat less carbs, keep the carbs down. And that means the diet energy comes from fat. And, I, and people who do this type of diet, and I'm not the only one, there are many of us, eat around 70 to 75% of our daily energy intake from fat, maybe as high as 80. If I didn't talk about mineral management, but getting the minerals right is critical to feeling well and functioning well. Um, and the simple things that people say, well, I'm, I did it, and it's been going pretty well, but I kind of got stuck. What do I do? And I say, when in doubt, eat less carbs. And when in doubt, eat more fat. Because it's the carbs that are going to block your fat oxidation and make it impossible for you to be in this sweet spot, this island of Hawaii in the middle of the dangerous shark-infested shark Pacific Ocean, if you will. And it, to be sustainable, it has to have pleasure and satisfaction. You have to have taste variety. And you have to be f free of the guilt of eating. Because we were all programmed to eat. If, if our ancestors didn't eat, even no matter how uneducated and dumb they were, if they didn't eat, they wouldn't survive. So we have this deeply ingrained thing to eat, a reason to eat. And I say, 
let's find a way to satisfy it. Thank you. Um, some people say, well, you, you have bad breath. Um, <laughs> urine strips are worthless because within a couple of weeks of going, going into ketosis, some of, us, some of us, our kidneys stop secreting or stop actively secreting the acetone and the, and the ketones. Um, and I use a simple gluco glucometer. It's, it's, it's like a glucose testing. You know, click, ouch, and it, and there's a, there, there's, there's just special strips for ketones, and it's very accurate. Um, and once I've done it 30 or 40 times, I have a good, pretty good idea of what dietary indiscretions make it go down. And I know that if, I've, if I'm kind of marginal, I want to make it go up, I go out and ride my bicycle for 20 mi 25 miles at, at 20 miles an hour, and it'll go right back up again. So, you know, you, you use the tool, like, you know, you don't have, you, when you first learn, once you get it as a habit, it's just kind of ingrained. One more question. I, l I think people should exercise for pleasure. And so if somebody weighs 50 pounds more than a healthy weight for them, telling them to go out and exercise to me is asking for collateral damage. So I, I th the diet works very well at getting weight off people. And then do what you feel good about doing, whether it's dancing or downhill skiing or whatever. But whether I exercise or not, my ketones stay above uh, 0.5 at the lowest and, and usually above 1. And so I go from 1 to 2.5, depending on the amount of exercise I do. So it, it, the exercise is not the primary driver of ketosis. It's the carbon protein restriction.